Good evening. That's right. Take this off. Good evening. Uh, my name is Michael Nock, and on behalf of the Mack and Maylander Committee, I'd like to welcome you to this evening's lecture with Andrea Simmons. Thank you very much for joining us. The Mack and Maylander Lecture Series was established in 1997 after Clark received gifts from Mary Mackin and Verna Slattery Maylander to establish an endowed lecture series. The lecture series throughout the year features prominent outside speakers, faculty, and alumni lectures. A few notes about our event tonight. Andrea's lecture is titled Back to Basics, Simplifying Modern Medicine with a Functional Approach. She will speak for around 45 minutes and then open it up for Q&A. If you have any questions, please type them into the YouTube feed and members of our committee will relay them to Andrea. The Mack and Mainlander theme for this academic year is 2020 Vision. As I'm sure you can all agree, the past year has been full of challenges, including but not limited to a global pandemic, a deratio, and a presidential election. With so much going on, it can sometimes be hard to see things clearly. Through our lecture series, we hope to help the Clark community and the larger Dubuque community to focus on the things that bring us together as we move into a new decade and an ever-changing world. Andrea has been helping future nurses at Clark to see things more clearly for five years. An assistant professor of nursing, she is also a board-certified family nurse practitioner with a background in pediatric and adolescent medicine, women's health, and family health care. Early in her practice, she developed an interest in functional medicine and has spent the last two years incorporating a more holistic approach to patient care. She also started her own practice here in Dubuque, a new health and wellness. When she is not at work, Andrea lives in southwest Wisconsin with her husband and three busy children. In her free time, she enjoys spending time with her family, walking her dog, gardening, and just being outside. We are extremely grateful to Andrea for her willingness to provide our Mack and Maylander faculty lecture this evening. Please join me in welcoming Andrea Simmons. Thank you, Michael, for that introduction, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining me tonight for this presentation. I'm excited to be talking to you about a topic that, I, that fascinates me and that I am extremely passionate about, and that is functional medicine. I have no conflicts of interest for this presentation, and I just wanted to include one disclosure, and that when we first designed or talked about doing this presentation, we were planning to do things face to face. As you all know, things are being done a little bit differently, and I'm happy that we're able to offer you this presentation virtually, and I hope that um, you'll be able to participate with us. I've tried to keep some of the interactive portions of the presentation so that you have a chance to add your thoughts to the presentation as well as ask any questions. So let's get started here. All right, so our objectives for tonight is to define health and wellness and discuss the differences between health span as well as lifespan. We'll explore the current state of health in our country and spend some time looking at how we approach healthcare from a traditional standpoint and compare that to a functional lens of care. My goal is to provide you with some key takeaways that may be beneficial for your own health and hopefully will allow you to see the necessary steps for in health, improving health for all of us. All right, so starting out, we'll test out that chat box. And when I say health and wellness, I'd love for you to tell me what words come to mind.
So we're seeing a few of these come through. So peace of mind was one of the things that we um, could see in the chat box. When you do just a basic Google search of what is health and what is wellness, if you stumble upon Merriam-Webster, one of our dictionaries, they define health as a condition of being sound in body, mind, and spirit. It is freedom from physical disease or pain and a general condition of the body. The World Health Organization defines health as a state of complete physical, mental, so and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Wellness, on the other hand, is a quality or state of being in good health, and it's something that's actively sought. There are goals involved. Wellness is a choice that we make requiring constant effort to achieve. When we compare that to what we believe about lifespan and health span, we know that lifespan is how long we live, and health span is how well we live. Advancements in science and medicine have afforded us new treatments, surgeries, drugs, and interventions that have increased the number of years that we live. Yet the question remains, if we're gonna live longer, is this necessarily a positive thing if the years that we live are not lived in quality or in a productive manner? So taking a look at the state of health today, we can see th the CDC says that there are five leading causes of death. These include heart disease, cancer, chronic lower respiratory disease, stroke, and unintentional injuries. These chronic diseases take the life of nearly 900,000 Americans every year, and it's estimated that 20 to 40% of them could be prevented. I've listed some of the most common modifiable risk factors here for you, that when these are addressed with personal behavior changes, the result is a decrease or avoidance in disease. I will say though with COVID-19 in the recent years, or the last year and a half, that COVID-19 is now listed in the newest data as the third leading cause of death. According to a 2019 RAND study, 60% of American adults now live with at least one chronic condition. 42% of them have more than one. And there are an estimated 30 million Americans living with at least five chronic conditions. And I've listed the most common chronic conditions here for you on the right side of the slide. In 2020, 2020, the American Health Rankings annual report found that adults suffering from three or more chronic conditions declined slightly by 0.8%. So why do we care about this? We care about this because the chronic conditions account for hundreds of billions of dollars in healthcare spending every year. It greatly impacts our lifespan as well as our health span. 90% of the nation's annual health care expenditures are spent on people with chronic or mental health conditions. And while there's been a slight decrease in the prevalence of heart disease, stroke, cancer, and diabetes, the rate of obesity continues to rise. In 2018, a CDC report stated that 42.4% of adults fit the obese category and 19% of children are obese. When we look at obesity overall, we have measures where we say somebody is overweight, they are obese, they are morbidly obese, and now we've created another category called super obese. 7% of adolescent girls and 9% of adolescent boys fall in this category. These figures are worse for our minority groups, and obesity is a major risk factor for all other chronic disease. So if we don't get the obesity under control, all of the other chronic conditions will also continue to rise. So what is impacting our health? These are the major factors that are impacting our health. Diet, exercise, stress, sleep, environment, in relationships. I also included genes in here. And 
what I oftentimes will hear from patients is they'll say, everyone in my family is overweight, or everyone has heart disease, or everyone has obesity. I think it's just in the cards for me to, to get these illnesses or these diseases. And one of the things that I will tell patients is, there's a quote by Dr. Oz, actually, and he says that genes are the gun in our environment. So all the other factors on that list are what pulls the trigger. So while somebody may be genetically predisposed to having a chronic disease, it is not the end of end all be all for them. They have a lot of other options for keeping those genes from getting turned on and preventing those chronic diseases. So looking at the two types of medicine, I want to first put out there that I am not advocating for either one, saying one is a, is a better way of medicine than the other. I think that there is definitely room for both of these in the medical field. I practice both types of medicine. I have patients who utilize both types of medicine, and I think that they are both very beneficial. So looking at traditional medicine, we can see that in traditional medicine that um, the approach is often, it's also referred to as conventional or Western medicine. And when a patient comes in, they'll sit down with the provider, they'll talk about their symptoms or groups of symptoms, and the provider will do an exam. They'll run some labs or some tests, and generally they will prescribe a medication. This is something that we've coined a pill for every ill. So if you have constipation, we've got a pill for that. If you have high blood pressure, we have a pill for that. If you have high cholesterol, there is a pill for that. Care tends to be algorithm-based, and it fits into more of a one-size-fits-all mentality. In the upper right-hand corner, I know that you cannot read that algorithm, but that is our, one of our algorithms for hypertension. And it's one of the things that we use to figure out based on what this patient is presenting with and how high their blood pressure is, what the next steps will be. Care tends to be focused on more of treating the disease versus prevention. And prevention in conventional medicine tends to really look at early disease diagnosis. So we order a mammogram to detect breast cancer. We order a colonoscopy to detect colon cancer. And so we're not looking necessarily to prevent those things, but to detect them early enough that we can intervene. We also kind of tend to do things in a collection of independent organ systems for a medical for each medical specialty. So care is often offered in silos. If you break a bone, you'll see an orthopedist. If you have a headache, you'll go to a neurologist. If you have palpitations, you'll go to a cardiologist. And if your foot hurts, you might see a podiatrist. The problem is that oftentimes these specialties will operate in silos and the care doesn't always overlap. We know that this is an area where we need to make improvements and certainly that's being worked on, but in the meantime, it's the primary care provider's responsibility to act as the umbrella over all of those silos to help pull all the care together. The standard traditional model of care works really well for acute disease and trauma, infections and emergencies. If you're in a car accident or you have an infection, you want the traditional medical model of care. So if we switch gears a little bit and look at the functional medicine lens, functional medicine focuses on health and it emphasizes the prevention of disease. In functional medicine, health is not defined just as absence of disease, but instead revolves around the vitality of the person. When disease occurs, the focus shifts to identifying and addressing the root cause of disease. Like traditional medicine, functional medicine is very much science-based, and it operates with the understanding that the body is an integrated network. No one system operates with the under without the other systems being involved. The goal is to identify and address the root cause of disease, and this is exemplified by the functional medicine tree. So let me ask you, if this tree were sitting in your front yard and right around where it says cancer or insomnia, there was a big bald patch and you noticed that there was a bunch of dead brown leaves on the ground, what would you do?
So cut out the dead parts, rake up the leaves, call a tree surgeon. We'll see if any more come in. So we're looking at our tree, if this is your tree in your front yard, you might get out a ladder, you might climb up there, look at the leaves, try to figure out what's going on, examine the other leaves around the tree, do they have any brown spots, is something wrong with them? You might then explore the branches. You may break one of the branches, see if it's still green inside. Is it living? Is it um, hollow inside? Has it died? As you move down the branches, you're going to go to the trunk, and you're going to look at the trunk. And what's happening with the trunk? Is there a hole bored through the trunk? Is the bark attached? Are there bugs or anything that would be causing this tree to, to die? And so pr prune carefully year after year so it doesn't happen in the first place. That goes exactly along with the functional medicine um, aspect that we're going to talk about. So that's perfect. Um, but you're exploring the trunk of the tree, and then you're going to look maybe at the soil and then at the roots. What's going on? Is there not enough nutrients in the dirt? Um, is there too many rocks in the soil that the roots cannot continue to grow? And so it stunted the growth and stunted the nutrients. You are looking at every aspect of that tree to try to figure out why is it not thriving. And you want to catch it before all the other leaves fall off the tree, and then you're cutting it down. Okay. So another way to look at this is we always say look upstream. And here you can see that there are people that have these flotation devices, and they're throwing them out to the people who are floating down the river. And you can see that they are missing some of the people that are floating down the river. And if we continue to just throw out the flotation devices, we are not going to save everybody that's floating down the river, right? But if we walk up to the big rock and we ask people, why are you jumping off this rock into the river? We are looking upstream and we're looking at what is causing this problem in the first place. So that is, um, one of the things that we highlight in functional medicine is always looking for the root cause or looking upstream at what's going on with the patient that's causing the signs and symptoms. And to do that, we focus on the diagnosis and the signs and symptoms, but we also look at the antecedents, triggers, and mediators. And our antecedents are things like environment and genetic factors. We also look at the mental, emotional, and spiritual influences, as well as the patient's experiences, attitudes, and beliefs. We incorporate lifestyle, as well as environmental factors, and all of these things put together help point us to the root cause of the disease. So what does a functional medicine office visit look like? In traditional medicine, generally we will spend 20 to 30 minutes provider dependent with a brand new patient. In functional medicine, we have the new patient come in and the first appointment is usually 60 to 90 minutes in length. We have them fill out an extensive health history form and we spend that time going through the health history form and really creating a timeline. I go all the way back to birth to the present day, however many years that includes, and we create this timeline. Once the timeline is done, I will retell the patient's story to them to make sure that I captured everything that they found important. Oftentimes when you retell somebody their story, they will pick up on things that might have been missed and they'll be able to add important pieces to that timeline. Once that is completed, we'll organize all the clinical imbalances. And one of the most important pieces I think to address is the patient's readiness to change. And that's a conversation that I have with every single patient because I can prescribe the latest and greatest in terms of medications or treatment plans, but if the patient isn't ready to make those changes, then it is not productive for either one of us and really a waste of time for both of us. We will also address the modifiable lifestyle factors first and foremost before we really talk about anything else. I will do labs, imaging, I will talk about supplements and prescribe medications when necessary. So let's look at a patient case. This is Sarah. Sarah is a 34-year-old patient who was referred to me by her primary care provider 
Sarah has a history of migraines, and when I sat down with her, her primary goal was to just gather up some information so that she could make an informed decision. She felt like she was at a turning point in her care where she either needed to continue with a plan, which she didn't feel was working, or advance to the next level of care, which meant adding additional medications to her regimen. And so with Sarah, um, we gathered up her history, and these are the, some of the pertinent things, certainly not all of them, but some of the pertinent things that I found. For her birth history, she was born at 34 weeks, and she was bottle fed. That has significance to me in terms of the relationship with her gut health. In childhood, she had frequent infections, and she was treated with antibiotics multiple times. She was also in a car, several car accidents and other accidents, which resulted in head trauma. In her adult years, around the age of 20, Sarah started getting migraines on a regular basis. And at the same time, she noticed that she started getting allergies. And she had several allergies to foods that she wasn't previously allergic to, to medications, as well as some environmental allergies. She also had a reaction around this time to an immunization that she had a previous dose of and had been fine before that. So no reaction before that. Signs and symptoms, in addition to her migraines, were low energy, lots of fatigue, as well as constipation and diarrhea. Contributing factors to her story were a high stress diet, or a high stress job, the standard American diet, and no exercise. Sarah was currently using Imitrex, which is a medication that we give for migraines, and she was taking it every day, at least once a day, if not two or three times a day. And at least one to two times per month, she was needing to go into her primary care provider's office and get an injection of Ketorolac, which is a medication that we often give to help relieve headaches. Sometimes this was effective and sometimes it was not. And there were several times where she would suffer for three to four days before they were able to break her headache. Her primary care provider had relayed that the next steps would be to either start an antidepressant, start a blood pressure medication, or start a birth control pill. And the birth control pill came in because a lot of Sarah's headaches seemed to get worse before and after her menstrual cycle. So after sitting with Sarah for about 75 minutes, my recommendations included diet. I wanted to address her gut health. We started a modified elimination diet that included no gluten and no dairy for three weeks. We talked about getting more movement and exercise in her regimen. I also recommended the hyperbaric, hyperbaric oxygen chamber for her, which can be very beneficial for people with head injuries and can help with some of the fatigue. I recommended supplements of probiotics as well as magnesium, probiotics to help with gut health and magnesium to help with her headaches. We stayed with her current medication regimen because I wanted to give the lifestyle modifications time to work in order to um, prevent her from becoming more miserable. We talked about detoxification, and the three primary ways that our body detoxifies is through urine, through stool, and through our skin via sweat. And so we talked about making sure that we regulated her bowel movements, making sure that she was getting plenty of fluids, as well as making sure that she was sweating every day, either through exercise or use of sauna. We added in some Epsom salt baths, as well as some lemon water first thing in the morning. I also drew labs on Sarah looking for any other indicators that would be um, contributing to her headaches. I saw Sarah back at one month because I always see patients back at the one, mar one, one month mark. We went through her labs and I asked her how she was doing and she said, I'm the same. Okay, so my next question is, what have you been doing? And she had not really changed anything. She had started taking the magnesium, and that was about the only recommendation that she was able to follow in that one-month time frame. So Sarah and I sat down and talked about her motivation and her goals and her willingness for change, and she had already started the ball rolling to switch her jobs because she felt that her job was contributing to her headaches. Um, certainly the high stress environment that she was working in. 
and then she thought that she could start committing to diet and exercise. I have seen Sarah back a couple times since then, and we have slowly been moving forward. I saw her last week um, for her regularly scheduled checkup, and I am happy to report that Sarah um, has not taken her Imitrex in three weeks. She has exercised regularly for the last two weeks. Her energy has immensely improved. Her stress has decreased, and um, she has had maybe two headaches this whole month at which time she, at the start of the headache, she was able to take a little bit of a leave and then not get the headaches at all. So much improvement there. All right, so looking at what things contribute to our health. And I will tell you that each of these topics could be a separate, detailed, week-long discussion in themselves, so I'm just going to hit the highlights. But the United States Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, publishes a toxic release inventory report every single year. And this report tracks the management of certain toxic chemicals that can pose a threat in our environment. One of the really neat things I found about this report is that you can search by state and you can even search by your city that you live in. And so just out of curiosity, I didn't search Dubuque, Iowa, but I did search in Iowa and found that in 2019, there were 21.3 million pounds of toxins released in the air. There were 5 million pounds of toxins released in our water and 4.2 million pounds of toxins released in the landfills. There are about 80,000 different chemicals in these toxins, and less than 10% of them have been tested for safety. In 2004, the Environmental Working Group did a study that found that there were over 200 chemicals and plastic components found in the cord blood of 10 placentas. Over 180 of those chemicals were found to cause cancer in humans and animals. And exposure to these chemicals causes inflammation, a weakened immune system, as well as imbalances in hormones and metabolism. We get pretty consistent exposure through our water, our food, cosmetics, detergents, lotions, soaps, plastics, flame retardants that are in our mattresses as well as on our furniture, as well as Teflon on our nonstick pans. Our bodies are designed to handle a lot of these toxins, but there's something called the total body burden. And it's similar to a scale. And as long as our body can keep up with the amount of toxins that we're being exposed to, we can prevent a lot of that inflammation and all of our systems continue to work properly. When that scale tips though, and we have more toxins than what we can get rid of, that's when we see a breakdown in the system and we are more likely to get chronic disease. So talking about nutrition, I would like to do a little poll and see what is the best advice you've ever received about food. So moderation is key. Very, very good. Grow your own or shop the outsides of the grocery store. That is also very, very good advice. Pay attention to portions and drink plenty of water. Also very good advice. 
All right. The best advice I feel like I give my patients is I tell them to eat the rainbow. And when I say eat the rainbow, I do not mean Skittles or Starburst or Fruit Loops or gumdrops or flavored donuts, um, but to really focus on fruits and vegetables because they are full of phytonutrients that are full of antioxidants that help us fight disease. And the standard American diet doesn't even supply a tenth of the micronutrients that we need as humans to prevent disease and obtain optimal health. I always have patients start with eating a whole foods diet and work on decreasing sugar. Our lives are laden with sugar. We know that one soda a day increases the risk of obesity by 60%. And 60% of calories consumed are from ultra-processed foods. Food companies have spent billions of dollars creating highly addictive foods. This is something we call or coin Franken-foods because they're not really real foods. They're engineered in a lab to taste, smell, and look like real food. But if you look at the ingredients on the label, oftentimes there is very little real food substance. And this creates a lot of confusion for patients. People come in all the time and they're not quite sure what it constitutes as healthy and what constitutes as not healthy. I see this a lot and patients will be really proud of themselves and they'll say, hey, I switched to yogurt. And we'll talk about the type of yogurt that they're now eating. And they say, well, on the label it says it's good for gut health and probiotics and it regulates your bowels and all of those wonderful things. And I ask them, did you turn it over and look at what's in it? This same yogurts that tout that they are so good for us in this tiny little container will have about 24 grams of sugar on average. Now keep in mind that for every four grams of sugar, it equals one, or four grams equals one teaspoon of sugar. So if you think about these tiny little containers, there are six teaspoons of sugar in there. And I'm not quite sure how they fit anything else in the containers, but they do. But the patients are confused because on the front, it says that it's healthy. Many of you can remember back in the 1980s and 1990s, we got on this craze where everything was low fat and they altered the foods to make it low fat because fats were supposed to be really horrible for us and they contributed to all kinds of disease. And that is really one of the hallmark things that occurred in the timeline of our food industry that really kind of took this whole idea of processing our foods to a whole new level. I always tell my patients that if there are more than 10 ingredients, you really need to explore whether you should be eating that or not. And if there's anything on the label that you can't pronounce, it's probably a great idea not to eat it. There are a ton of fun food facts out there, and I could spend a couple hours talking to you about some of them. Um, one of my favorite fun food facts comes from research that was done at the University of Western Australia in Perth, and they studied 2,000 Chinese women and found that those that consumed one-third of an ounce of a fresh mushroom every day, so that's about one mushroom every day, were 64% less likely to develop breast cancer. When they combined eating mushrooms with regular consumption of green tea, this reduced their breast cancer risk by 89%. That's pretty significant and pretty cool for a tiny little mushroom to be able to do that. All right, moving on to exercise and movement. One of the very first things that I always tell people is that you cannot out-exercise a bad diet. I will have lots of people come in and tell me they eat the standard American diet, but it's okay because they ran two miles that day. Consumption of one 20-ounce soda, in order to burn that off, you need to walk four and a half miles. One supersized fast food meal requires you to run four miles a day for an entire week just to burn that off. About 88% of Americans do not get enough exercise, even though exercise has been shown to improve insulin resistance, reduce stress, improve our brain health, reduce our risk of chronic disease, improve detoxification, improve sexual function, as well as slow the aging process. 
in order to help people incorporate more movement in their day, which I think is even harder now that a lot of us are working from home and we are tied to computers for great amounts of time during the day, but I have people set timers so that they can remember to get up and move. I have them start small. We tend to think that a lot of our lifestyle modifications have to be an all or nothing thing. So people will go gung-ho. We see this a lot at the beginning of the year when everyone's making New Year's resolutions and by February 1st, we all have kind of petered out and those resolutions have gone out the door. This has to be something that people incorporate into their lifestyle. So every hour, maybe they get up and they walk around for five minutes. In between meetings, maybe they walk around the house or get outside and get some fresh air. Um, having them do squats while they're listening to a Zoom meeting, certainly off camera for their peers, of course. But making it small, making it fun, if they can find a workout buddy, having that accountability oftentimes will help somebody to kind of drag your bum out to get you moving. And then also giving grace. I see this a lot with people where they say, I, I didn't exercise for a day or I ate really horrible for a day and so I just gave up. We have to remember to be very kind to ourselves and know that life gets in the way and we have lots of ups and downs. And so giving grace to ourselves and allowing us to be human is also a really important part of this. Sleep. Sleep is very important. The CDC puts out a report. Their last one was in 2014, but they say that the optimum amount of sleep is at least seven hours per night. The reports that they do can also be narrowed down by state. So I have the ones listed. I know they're harder to see on the PowerPoint for Iowa, but they found that in 2014, in the state of Iowa, 33.2% of males and 29.1% of females were not getting enough sleep. And I would argue that I'm sure that these numbers have probably increased over the course of the last year with everything we've had going on. Not getting enough sleep for one night causes us to be drowsy. It allows, or it causes us to have decreased energy, and it can produce an irritable mood. When we don't get enough sleep, our stress hormone cortisol rises and our hunger hormone ghrelin rises, which causes us to lose more sleep as well as allows our body to store glucose and fat much differently. Consistently getting less than seven hours of sleep puts us at higher risk for obesity, inactivity, and high-risk behaviors like smoking and excessive alcohol use. And the chart on the right-hand side shows that those who get less than seven hours of sleep are at greater risk for chronic conditions like heart attacks, heart disease, stroke, asthma, COPD, cancer, arthritis, chronic kidney disease, as well as diabetes. Stress. I am sure that any of you watching know nothing about stress, um, especially in the last year. I feel like this is something that every single one of my patients, it's something that we can almost palpate off of people these days. In 2018, there was a study done by Cigna and um, and there was also a Gallup poll um, that showed that 60% of adults reported an increase in stress and 59% of adults reported an increase in worry. This resulted in a decrease in our ability to find enjoyment for 61% of Americans. That's a lot of people who are not finding enjoyment day to day. When our stress increases, we're more likely to make unhealthy lifestyle choices. And stress can cause, again, an increase in that cortisol, which then increases our risk of developing one of those chronic diseases. Relationships is one of those last lifestyle factors that I like to assess. And in 2018, Cigna revealed that loneliness was now considered an epidemic in America. And I would think that after this year, those numbers have definitely increased. In their study, nearly half of Americans reported sometimes or always feeling lonely. 47% said that they felt left out. And two in five Americans sometimes or always felt that their relationships had little or no meaning and that they were often isolated from others. One of the things that I found interesting about this study was that Generation Z, so those ages 18 to 22, were labeled the loneliest generation. 
they concluded that we are lacking human connection across the board. And interesting enough, at the very end of this study, they had a few statements about how those who got sufficient sleep reported being less lonely, and those who had regular physical activity also reported being less lonely. So that gives us credence to how all of these lifestyle modifications are interrelated. So shifting our thinking, one of my favorite quotes is by Benjamin Franklin, and he said, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. If we can prevent some of these things from happening, we decrease money spent, time spent, patient un be patients being uncomfortable, and we increase not only our lifespan, but also our health span. And one of the things that I have found in the research and through some clinical site visits is that we don't do a really good job educating our providers about these preventative measures. Part of my position here at Clark is to do clinical site visits for a patient and students, and I was in with a student watching her do her patient care, and she was doing a wonderful job, but at the end of the visit, the patient said, I have been in the pre-diabetes category forever. My numbers are only continuing to go up. I fear that the next time that I come in here, I'm gonna to be told that I have diabetes. And I've tried lots of diets, I can't lose weight, and I don't understand what I'm doing wrong. And the student got this deer in the headlights look, and she said, I'm gonna to talk to my preceptor about this and we'll address it when we come back in which was a great and appropriate response. She did talk to her preceptor about it, but when the preceptor came back in, she ended up getting distracted during the visit, and so the woman left getting really good care but never addressing her primary concern. And so that kind of sparked thoughts in my head about what should we be doing differently to empower our students to have the knowledge that she could have addressed that with the patient while she was in the room. When we look at the literature, there is a lot of emphasis now that we need to start paying attention to prevention. And studies focus, tell us that we focus primarily on treating patients and looking at immediate health problems versus focusing on prevention. And while nurse practitioners do an okay job at it, none of the providers, whether they were physicians, MDs, or nurse practitioners regularly addressed this concern. And so I came back to Clark after my cl clinical site visit and I talked with Drs. Lisa Rettenmeyer and Angel Keller about where the gaps in our program might exist. And so we started incorporating some of these health modalities in our courses. And in one course specifically, we have students now signing up for one of these topics and they will research the topic and they present to their peers on the evidence-based practice around that topic. Those who are not presenting are tasked with finding additional topics to address related to that. So the goal is that they end up having this really robust conversation about healthy weights and diet and supplements and exercise so that they can have a wide variety of information and a wide variety of tools that when confronted with these questions in clinic, they feel more empowered to answer those questions for the patients. We have turned this into a research study. We are evaluating the effectiveness by giving the, pa the students a pretest as well as a post test. Last year, because of COVID, we didn't get great results in the post test, so we're repeating it again this year with students. But we also added an additional piece where we are surveying our students who had the information last year to see how they've implemented or if they've implemented this into clinical practice. And so we'll be really excited this spring to get those results. All right. My references are here, but we will go back and answer any questions that you may have. Biggest barrier to providing this type of medicine in your practice? 
the biggest barrier to providing this type of medicine is cost. The cost of some of this um, insurance doesn't often will cover the patient's visit, but they don't cover a lot of the supplements. They don't cover a lot of the additional treatment modalities um, like the hyperbaric oxygen chamber and those types of things that patients may participate in. I hear a lot from people that they worry about they can't afford to eat healthier. So we do a lot of talking about the different grocery stores that exist in Dubuque, because that's where my practice is. And we talk about where they can find the best fruits and vegetables for the cheapest price. We talk about having this time of year, especially frozen, because we don't have a lot of fresh produce. Utilizing the farmer's markets in the summertime, um, they have a wonderful produce at decent prices. And so we will um, spend a lot of time. There was a study that I read not too long ago where they said that Costs per ounce, it would cost more to eat Snickers than it actually did to eat a healthy food item like an apple or a pear. But um, it just really depends on season. So we talk about eating in season. Um, exercise, people feel like they need to go to the gym and they don't. We talk about filling up milk jugs with water or with sand and using those as resistance or um, making sure they can get outside if they can walk their dog, go to the mall and walk. Um, Obviously, this time of year, it's they have to do most things inside. Um, but also, what are the outside activities that they can do when it's not 20 below zero? Um, so that probably would be the biggest problem that I see. So there was a question about spirituality and how spirituality affects our physical health. And I think that for people I found have, there is a spectrum of where they fear, feel that spirituality lies. And for some, it is very deeply rooted in them. And so we work on that. And I always ask, you know, what does that mean to you? And, and getting that meaning, I feel like it means something a little bit different to everyone. And understanding how that impacts their life and their beliefs really helps me to tailor their care and make it individualized for that, that person. So uh, let's see, aside from after effects of having the disease itself, what might be the long-term health span impacts we experience emerging from the COVID-19 pandemic? So there is this whole thought process um, about, and they've actually labeled it as long hauler syndrome, um, where we have lots of people who had their symptoms revol resolve and then return. We have some people who have never had their symptoms resolve, and that is an area of medicine in both in the traditional realm as well in the functional realm that people are trying to feverishly figure out. We don't have a lot of answers in regards to why we're seeing what we're seeing. Um, understanding the mechanism of how this virus is internally changing the metabolism of our cells and, and the mitochondria and the ATP and how things are being, how our energy is being made. We see lots of people with fatigue. Um, I've seen a lot of people with um, persistent um, coughing and shortness of breath. For those people, we are really working on detoxing and trying to get the system back as quickly as possible to regular function. And detoxing might mean extra um, glutathione, which is one of our major detoxing um, properties in our body. We might give them something called NAC that is a precursor to glutathione, and so that may help them to make their own glutathione. It's something that we naturally make in the body, but we're finding that our glutathione levels get depleted very, very quickly with COVID-19. And so if they're having respiratory issues, we can do inhaled glutathione. Otherwise, we can do um, IV glutathione, and that seems to be helping. You can also take glutathione orally, but that is really, really expensive for people. And so the IV and the inhaled tend to be a little bit cheaper for them. Um, long term, it is really about helping people think about how they're going to prevent COVID-19 or how they are going to bounce back. We know that the healthier they are before they get the virus, the easier it will be for them to bounce back and return to the norm. Um, 
And so really talking to people about building their immune system. And so when we look at somebody who's had COVID, what can we do to support that immune system? Where are the breakdowns in that immune system? And again, a lot of that has to do with detoxification and really building the immune system. We know that 70 to 80% of our immune system stems from our gut. And so oftentimes if we can work really hard on gut health and improving the gut, if they have leaky gut, if they have intestinal bacterial overgrowth or intestinal fungal overgrowth, depending on their signs and symptoms, if they have dysbiosis, based on what they're telling me and sometimes based on specialty testing, we can figure that out and work really hard to heal that gut, strengthen that immune system, decrease the inflammation that is caused by the COVID-19 and the gut health issues, and then get the person feeling better. So do we use alternative medicine practices, for example, Eastern medicine? We oftentimes correlate functional medicine with um, integrative medicine, and really we look to integrate every possibility that we can. So we have patients doing acupuncture and massage. We have patients doing Reiki. We do myo-abdominal massage. Um, lots of we have patients who use essential oils. And so we, I really, um, we in general in functional medicine will incorporate those things into practice and always support the patients who want to choose to try those things as part of their health care. Sure. So the HBOT therapy um, is really good. It, it, it is not my area of expertise, but it is really good for what it does is it supplies a great deal of oxygen to the body. And we use it in the clinic. Um, the person that I share the clinic with, uh, she actually uses it a lot in her cancer patients. Um, but we have athletes who come in who have head injuries, um, people who have had strokes come in, and it helps with supplying those areas of injury with more oxygen. We have somebody who broke her arm, and she came in to do the HBOT therapy so that um, it would heal a little bit faster. But in people who have had strokes or who have had head injuries, especially some of our younger athletes who have had concussions, it can be very beneficial in helping to relieve some of the symptoms and helping those areas of the brain to heal. Now, of course, in stroke, it will depend on how much um, long-term damage has been there, but there doesn't seem to be um, any correlation between how long ago they had the stroke um, that I have seen in the literature. So people who have had strokes 10 years ago can do the HBOT therapy. Um, one of the main things that I think um, inhibits people from doing it is it is this big tube. And so anybody who is claustrophobic has a really hard time with HBOT therapy um, because they kind of get shut in there. And although they can see out and they can talk to people on the outside, you can have your phone in there, a tablet or book, anything that you want. It's really hard for some people to be able to do that because they, they are claustrophobic. Um, let's see. So recommendations for healing the gut. So in healing the gut, if we, we can do specialty testing to find out exactly what's going on with the gut. And when we look at the gut, our gut is made up of, um, it's about a cell layer thick of endothelial cells. And in those cells, there are tight junctions. And the tight junctions are um, designed to stay closed. And when we eat the standard American diet, we have lots of stress, we take certain medications like antibiotics or um, proton pump inhibitors, oral contraceptives, we can have a breakdown in that lining of the gut and those tight junctions will open up. What happens is the food particles that we eat will get through those tight junctions. And when they get through those tight junctions, our immune system is all over that. And they will recognize those food particles as foreign invaders and create this inflammatory response. When we do that over and over again, we have a lot of inflammation then in the gut. And we can have an imbalance between the 
good bacteria and the bad bacteria. We'll see this with people who have had a lot of antibiotics where they just, their bacteria gets imbalanced. And so they may not have the leaky gut where the junctions have opened up, but they will have more bad bacteria than good bacteria. I will see this sometimes in people who have taken a certain probiotic for a long period of time in that the probiotic, they keep getting the same bacteria in the gut over and over again. And so they will have an imbalance of the bacteria that's there. If we go down a little bit further into the small intestines, generally we don't have a ton of bacteria in our, in our small intestine and we don't have a lot of fungus in there, but we can have something called SIBO or CIFO, which is small intestinal bacteria overgrowth or small intestinal fungal overgrowth. Oftentimes patients will say they get a lot of bloating after they eat or especially with certain foods, they have a lot of gas, um, they may have some discomfort. I see SIBO a lot in patients who have chronic constipation. We see leaky gut a lot in people with chronic constipation. But we also see it on the other end of the spectrum where there's some dysbiosis with people who have chronic diarrhea. So it really just depends and you have to take into consideration what else is happening and what signs and symptoms they're reporting. But we can do, if there is a bacterial overgrowth, the, there is a treatment which includes antibiotics, but there are also some botanicals that we can use, things like berberine and marshmallow root to calm the gut. Um, berberine works really good. Oregano can work really good. One of the things that we can do with specialty testing is take a culture and figure out what those bacteria are sensitive to. We can also see if there is a an increase of a product called calprotectin that is naturally in the gut. That generally tends to be associated with irritable bowel disease in patients. We can see if there are eosinophils there related to allergies or sensitivities, or we can see if there is something called secretory IgA. If our secretory IgA is elevated, oftentimes that will lead us to dysbiosis in how we treat. Uh, glutamine in general is a usually a powder substance. You can also take it in a pill that works really well for healing that lining of the gut. But there are lots and lots of things that we can do. First and foremost, though, the very best thing that you can do is to eat the rainbow and get phytonutrients because all of those phytonutrients, all of those fruits and vegetables have a mix of prebiotics and probiotics that will naturally feed the gut the way it's supposed to be fed. So we can short-term do some probiotics. Probiotics don't always make people feel better. And I will say you have to be very, very careful when you're supplementing. There is a study out, and I don't know where it came from, to be honest, um, where they talked about um, how supplements that we get in our traditional um, grocery stores and places like Walmart and Target, um, CVS, Walgreens, those supplements oftentimes contain so many added ingredients that what is actually in them and what it says on the bottle do not match. And so you have to be very careful because you just end up with really expensive pee or really expensive poop. And so um, I would always encourage people who are going to do supplementation, one, to know what you take because supplements can be just as dangerous as medication. Mm -hmm. So make sure you talk to a healthcare provider and also be very conscientious of the quality of the supplement that you are, you are taking because it does make a difference. And people kind of squawk a little bit about paying more for some higher quality. But when I usually explain to them that the other ones, you may be paying a dollar less, but you're getting absolutely no benefit from them, then the benefit outweighs um, that cost for them. Um, let's see. So, Norma said, how is it similar or different from home? Homeopathy. So homeopathy can be a part of that. So everybody, um, homeopathic practices, if patients are coming in and doing those, we take note of those and then just incorporate them into them. But the functional medicine lens is really looking at the root cause. When we think about treatment modalities, that's where some more of the integrated medicine, traditional medicine, homeopathic medicine, alternative medicine pieces come in to figure out what's going to work best for that particular person in regard to uh, treatment options. Are you seeing people opting to use alternative medicine options in lieu of getting the COVID vaccine? Yes, I am. 
I am seeing people who are not getting the COVID vaccine and they are working really, really hard through either diet and exercise or IV supplementation or um, oral supplementation to just make sure that their immune system is as strong as it possibly can be. And they feel very strongly about not getting the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, we have patients who have been vaccine injured um, or who have had a response to a vaccine previously. And so they are very, very cautious about getting any additional vaccines and thus um, choose not to get the COVID-19 vaccine. So that is not something that I require in the clinic um, because I don't want to exclude any patients. We certainly wear masks and take all precautions with every single patient that comes in the door, um, but we are not requiring vaccination. All right, any other questions? Are we good? All right, well, thank you all very much. I hope this was informative for you. Please let me know in the future. You can email me at Clark or stop me in the hall if you have any other questions. Have a great night, everyone.